Welcome to Electrified. It's your host, Dylan Loomis. Quick shout out to my newest patrons, Eric N and Ranjan P. Thank you for choosing to support the channel. First up, just a quickie, but Tesla Twitter has made it official. The blind spot camera is indeed adjustable between these three different locations. Here we have another quick one, but probably eventually an impactful one as the Canadian Minister of Innovation is currently at Fremont meeting with Tesla to see how they can innovate more and do more together. Half of this video was in English and in that about 30 seconds, he didn't really say anything impactful other than he's currently meeting with Tesla in Fremont. Next up, we have a really cool question and answer session with Arnie Alzen, who is the CIO and president of Worm Capital, a company we've talked about here before. They're definitely bullish on Tesla, but he's just somebody who gets the story and the narrative and I want to read you some of this but rather than you watching me read I'll put some b-roll on the screen just so you know at the end of quarter two this year worm capital had around 387 million dollars in AUM one last qualifier before getting into it Arnie's no slouch he has three decades of investment experience he founded and was the CIO of alls in capital management he also got his JD from Oregon Law School in 84 he also got his CPA in 1985 and worked at KPMG so here are the highlights from this Q&A with Arnie Asked about the current stock market volatility, he said, market prices are just not worth getting too worked up over. I coach this to the team, but the only thing that matters over the long term is the companies you own and their ability to compound out in value. The best companies always rip back. I happen to think that once some of these macro issues subside, you'll see a V-shaped recovery in the stock prices of certain businesses. Now shifting gears, here's what he had to say about Tesla. The concentration in Tesla is a unique situation and it's a reflection of my conviction in their market dominance relatively early in the cycle. I view owning Tesla in 2022 like owning Apple in 2007 or maybe even 2003 or maybe even earlier. This company is going to be much, much bigger than Apple in my opinion. In my investing career, I have never come across a position that I not only thought had the potential for massive returns moving forward, but one that I had the utmost conviction in even more so than Amazon. I think we've barely scratched the surface of what this company can become, and so my view, we have to own it in size. My projections for Tesla's growth are far, far beyond the consensus view right now. I like to stay calm and dispassionate about these types of situations, but the truth is I'm giddy. I think we could be set up for a couple years of strong growth, far beyond what Wall Street is expecting. Basically, my exact sentiment. Over the next few quarters, I think we're going to see a swell of activity around Tesla in the investment community and on Wall Street. In my mind, it's not a question of if, it's a question of when. I continue to think Tesla is destined to be Wall Street's favorite stock. It's got all the right ingredients, fast growth into vast global end markets, rapidly expanding gross and net margins, a wide moat, endless demand for the product, and crazy potential upside from energy storage FSD, bots, AI, none of which I think are priced into the stock. For those of you who know me well, you know that this work, investment research, is all I do. I probably spend 60, maybe 80 hours a week purely on research. Gave up golf about a decade ago, no more meetings. I've devoted myself to this enterprise and I love it. Over the last few years, a solid percentage of that time has been on Tesla. I've probably watched Tesla's battery day from 2020 about 15 times now. I know it sounds crazy and maybe it is, but you pick up so much information by just listening and re-listening. There's also just an incredible amount of passion in the Tesla community that produces some exceptional fundamental research available online via podcasts and newsletters and videos. I'm really, really excited for the future. It's been astounding to watch, and I think the market is just going to be waking up to it over the next few quarters. I think the market is making a major mistake about the potential explosive margin expansion. Behind the scenes, we've been doing a ton of analysis on the cost of each car produced and the unit economics of this business. It's profound. I think Tesla could have a better margin structure than Apple has with its iPhone on a product that's many orders of magnitude more expensive. Think about that. The cash flow and net income implications of this are staggering and lead me to believe the most probable outcome for 2024 net income could be around $50 billion. For some context, the consensus is about half of that figure. Back to Arnie, he said, I come up with around 60 times 2024 earnings, which I view as conservative, and that leaves me with a present value of about a $3 trillion market cap, or roughly three times today's price. Will Wall Street wake up and take this view tomorrow? Probably not, no, but give it a few more quarters and I think they're going to be forced to sharpen their pencils. 
But the truth is I'm most interested in some of the core engineering and software developments at Tesla. For one, we're hyper-focused on developments of FSD and the application of AI. There's just enormous potential there to leverage Tesla's data. It's a sleeping giant of the business. The application of AI isn't factored into my near-term profit calculations, by the way. These are opportunities that function as essentially free call options. It's a unique situation, one that I am very happy about. And lastly, Arnie said, we just have many positive catalysts ahead for us at Tesla. As I coach the team, I view Tesla like the racehorse secretariat. We just keep winning and the lead keeps expanding. Meanwhile, the stock hasn't really budged in a year and a half, which is building tension. So we'll see what happens over the next few months, but I'm very, very optimistic about the potential for 2023 and 2024. These are the words of a man who just gets it. The full Q&A will be linked below. Moving on, my next goal for today is to bring some clarity to this 4680 production situation when it comes to Berlin and Austin and Austin being prioritized. I'll be honest, I've seen the direct email from Tesla's management going over all of the detailed analysis of what's going to be changing with Giga Berlin 4680 production and I will be able to share a portion of that. But before we get into that, I want you to know the two main takeaways from this topic. First, there are indeed some things changing when it comes to 4680 production at Berlin and the economics minister and the people up in power in Berlin just aren't privy to this level of granular detail of what's changing with this very complicated 4680 production process. Second, with that said, 4680 production at Giga Berlin is 100% going to move forward. They will continue to ramp and scale the production processes in a pilot line fashion, working out some of the issues. It's just certain parts of that process are going to change and some will be shifted to Austin. Before we get to the email, let's just run through these German sources that came out today. Pay attention to how vague they are and we'll go point by point saying if it's true or false. Green is true, pink is false, yellow is I cannot confirm nor deny. The factory will continue to ramp up and go into operation, but not as planned. There are indeed some changes here to capitalize on the Inflation Reduction Act. But it is true that the equipment already installed at Giga Berlin for the 4680 cell production will not be removed and shipped to the USA. And this one should be obvious, but yes, it's true that the 4680 building at Berlin is not going to be dismantled. Now, I cannot confirm or deny that there are also no direct effects when it comes to personnel planning. It's true that because of the Inflation Reduction Act, the top priority is to concentrate on putting the battery cell plants in Austin into operation as quickly as possible. And for Grünheide, that means changed priorities, so Austin takes precedence. Now, I do wanna qualify this. This changed priorities process refers to very specific parts of the 4680 production process, not the entire process itself. So certain parts of the process are going to continue to ramp at Berlin and maybe even scale up faster, while other parts are going to indeed change and adjust to shift some priority to Austin. And lastly, we have comments from Jörg Steinbach. Part of it's true. He said it cannot be ruled out that the schedules may change. There's always uncertainty with this process for Tesla. This part is false. He said the expansion in Grünheide, both in terms of equipment and staff, continues unaffected by this. This is not true. Some parts of this process are definitely being affected. And lastly, from RBB24, this part is partially false. It says the battery cell production at the German Tesla site is to be progressed faster than previously planned, despite the US prioritization. Again, this is false because only parts of the 4680 production process are going to be expedited at Berlin. Other parts are indeed going to be paused or delayed and reprioritized. And we already went over this, this is still true. And the last one, it's true, both factories are to be ramped up in parallel, even if the ramp up in Texas is now to be accelerated. So for what you've been waiting for, here are direct quotes from the email that I saw that I'm able to share. The section was titled, we will do the following in Berlin. Electrode commissioning and production ramp will continue at full speed and we will ship the electrode to Texas to be completed into cells. Also, installation of additional tablets and assembly equipment will be paused. Crated equipment to be redirected to Texas. Hopefully in the coming weeks, I can share more with you guys, but for now, this is three great examples of what's going on. First, we have electrodes being made at Berlin. That process will continue, but those electrodes are going to be shipped to Austin to then be made into 4680s in Texas. Second, we have the installation of additional tablets and assembly equipment being paused. 
And third, some crated equipment that hasn't yet been unpacked at Berlin is going to be shipped to Texas, so a reprioritize from Berlin to Texas. So hopefully this brings some clarity and more importantly, nuance to this conversation. Yes, some parts of the 4680 production process in Berlin are changing and being reprioritized, or yes, even paused in some cases, but other parts are continuing to ramp full steam ahead. And this should not be viewed as a negative thing for Giga Berlin at all. Their Model Y production can still continue even with this reprioritization. And ultimately this seems like a no brainer, but it's just a matter of Tesla taking advantage advantage of a massive opportunity in the United States market as they should. All right, shifting gears to a few analyst updates. Needham has changed its Tesla analyst over to Vikram Bagri, and he's raised the rating to hold from underperform. It's weird though, because he says, in fact, we see several potential catalysts that could drive the stock higher, but they have a hold rating. Here's a list of his potential Tesla stock catalysts, but it's nothing we haven't been over before. So go ahead and pause and read if you would like. Here we have Morgan Stanley saying Tesla is a cheap, yes, we said that way to gain exposure to the global battery supply chain. Tesla may be one of the only companies in the world that can open up new gigafactories and generate positive EBITDA right away. And he said the Inflation Reduction Act could be almost too good for Tesla. Next up, this has been generating a lot of buzz and anxiety today among Tesla investors as Giga Shanghai has cut the wait times for all models across the board. Now they all start on the short end at one week, but most of them now have longer ranges. Previously, it was about one month on average, the range for a wait time. Now, in some cases, the range has gone up to two months, AKA more variants. Before we jump in, I'm not at all saying Tesla has a demand problem right now, but at some point, the demand for Teslas in this current price bracket is going to slow down, especially when you factor in everything going on with the macro space. And this is globally, not just in the United States. China has its own economic problems. So a slowdown in demand to some degree is not out of the question. Once again, that doesn't have to be a problem for Tesla because they have plenty of demand levers that they can still pull at any time. I did check the Chinese configurator to confirm these times, but Sawyer put it in a tweet that's easier for you guys to see. Now, we all know that production at Giga Shanghai has increased substantially after the upgrades. That's obviously part of this equation. But remember, this is the last month of the quarter. Right now, Tesla is focusing on local domestic deliveries rather than exporting these vehicles. So of course, wait times in the domestic Chinese market are going to go down with a greater production and now all being focused to that market. Once again, maybe next month, these wait times go back up as Tesla again shifts back to exporting for Europe. Some people also were concerned about this. Some local news reported in China that Tesla has been offering an incentive for the Model 3 and the Model Y for people who receive their vehicles between September 16th and the 30th, they'll receive 1,140 US dollars in a subsidy if they choose to purchase insurance at a Tesla store. So to me, at least for now, this seems like a very short term incentive, probably just to boost the numbers for the end of the quarter. Again, maybe it's just Tesla trying to incentivize more people there buying Tesla insurance so it continue to gather more data on that market. And I just have to say, even if Tesla cuts prices in any market, it's not the end of the world. I do think this will happen eventually. Elon said the prices are basically laughably high. So it's not the end of the world if this happens. It doesn't mean demand is cratering. Remember, Tesla's operating with 30% margins. They have all kinds of demand levers they can still pull. And Elon wants to have the prices lower. So I just wanna make it clear that worrying about Tesla's demand right now is a fool's errand. Maybe this will change. Maybe we get new information on the Q3 call, but for now, it's all good. Before we move on, as I mentioned, just keep in mind that China has its economic issues of its own. So this is something to be aware of. Interestingly enough, I did not know this was happening, but yes, China's Evergrande, the real estate company that's in all kinds of trouble and causing a ripple effect through the economy, now they're making their first mass produced EV. The EV unit is key for Evergrande, the world's most indebted developer that's been reeling with that over $300 billion worth of liabilities. This new Hengqi 5 model will begin deliveries in October. That will be interesting at the very least. And last up for today, we get some interesting comments from Jim Farley. I'm very curious on your opinions of these comments. Jim said, we're investing in ICE segments where we're dominant and where we can think as competitive leave the segments, we can actually grow. 
I find it intriguing that we're portraying the future of our industry as monolithic. That's not how it goes. That's not how it's going to manifest itself. And he said, not all segments will go electric at the same time and some may never, specifically calling out heavy duty truck classes and the F series super duty. If you're towing a fifth wheel trailer or you have a bucket body on the back of a chassis cab super duty, an electric vehicle makes almost no sense. It's tough to argue with this one because if you've watched any of the videos of EVs towing, if you're towing something pretty serious, they just don't perform as well as their internal combustion engine counterpart. Jim said, look, we'll do what's required and we're going to grow our EV business to 2 million vehicles in four years and most of that will be conquest, but we want loyal customers who own F-150s and Broncos and Mustangs to continue to have a great experience. And on the California ice ban, if they're not able to be sold in California, so be it. But there are plenty of other places to drive a Mustang in the US. And lastly, touching on the Inflation Reduction Act, he said, we're moving as much of that raw material processing back to the US. But it's not just because policy will reward us financially, it's because we want to help build a battery raw material processing ecosystem here in America. We've learned over the 120 years of the company that works best. There it is, let me know what you think. I hope you guys have a safe and a wonderful weekend. Please like the video if you did, and a huge thank you to all of my Patreon supporters.